Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the adenylylcyclase protein kinase A pathway. Okay, right. So, we've just discussed the G protein cycle, which is this cycle of activation of heterotrimeric G proteins by a G protein coupled receptor. What we now want to do is go away from this general um, setup and look specifically at certain heterotrimeric G proteins which are going to be activated by certain G protein coupled receptors and which are then going to activate adenylylcyclases. Okay, so we're going to be interested in heterotrimeric G proteins which are called GS heterotrimeric G proteins, and what this naming means is it means that the alpha subunit of these heterotrimeric G proteins is within the family of G alpha S alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins, which remember contains these two members, okay, G alpha S and also G alpha OLF. Now, generally, when people say GS, they do mean a heterotrimeric G protein which has as its alpha subunit G alpha S, and then it also has two beta and gamma subunits. But of course, we don't know, neither do we really care what those actually are. Okay, but as I said earlier, G alpha OLF alpha subunits do pretty much exactly the same thing as G alpha S. Okay, it's just they're found in different. Uh, places, okay, so in certain tissues such as the olfactory epithelium, G alpha OLF is the alpha subunit that takes the place of G alpha S, so there's no, well, very little expression of G alpha S alpha subunits, but instead you have high expression of G alpha OLF. Okay, right, so we're now going to have a heterotrimeric G protein where the alpha subunit is a G alpha S family alpha subunit, okay? And we're going to see the signaling cascade that these alpha subunits uh, produce when they're activated. Okay, so, um, firstly there will be some G protein coupled receptor which needs to be coupled to a GS heterotrimeric G protein. And from now on we'll just focus on G alpha S alpha subunits, but bear in mind that G alpha OLF is going to trigger the exact same pathway. Okay, so let me give you an example of a G protein coupled receptor which is going to be coupled to GS heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, so here is our G protein coupled receptor with its seven membrane spanning alpha helices. And the example of a G protein coupled receptor which is going to be coupled to GS that is the sort of prototypical example would be a beta 2 adrenoreceptor. Okay, so I'll put beta 2 AR. So this is a receptor for adrenaline and noradrenaline. Okay, so for short, this is called an adrenoreceptor. Okay, or AR, even shorter. A for adreno, R for receptor. Okay, and basically the ligand for beta-2 adrenoreceptors is either adrenaline or noradrenaline. So let's say we've got adrenaline coming on, which I'll just abbreviate to A. And another name, by the way, for adrenaline is epinephrine. Okay, so what will happen is uh, the... Um, oh, it's not spelt like that, I don't think. Like that, rather. It should have a P there, sorry. Let me rewrite that out. Okay, epi nephrine. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, when adrenaline binds to the beta-2 adrenoreceptor, it will trigger a conformational change, which will then be translated down to the intracellular loops. The intracellular loops will change conformation so that they now have available binding site for the alpha subunit of a GS heterotrimeric G protein, which means that the alpha subunit is a G alpha S. Okay, so it will come and bind along with its beta gamma complex attached to it, and then you'll get the activation. Okay, so what we've now got is our alpha S subunit, which is over here, which is now in the on state. Okay, so it's going to have GTP bound to it, and we now want to see what is this alpha S uh, subunit in the on state actually going to do? Well, it's going to take action on adenylylcyclase enzymes. Okay, so I want to discuss adenylylcyclases now in a little bit more detail. Okay, so 
adenylyl cyclase enzymes. There are 10 adenylyl cyclase enzymes in humans. Nine of these adenylyl cyclase enzymes are membrane-bound adenylyl cyclase enzymes. Okay, so nine are going to be membranous adenylyl cyclases. Okay, so they're going to be within the membrane. And then one is going to be a soluble adenylyl cyclase, and for short, this is abbreviated to the SAC. So the little s here stands for soluble, and then the AC stands for adenylyl, and then the C for cyclase. Now, this final tenth adenylyl cyclase, we're not going to be interested at all here, okay? It's found in very scarcely in the human body. It's found largely in the testes, okay? We're going to concentrate on the nine membrane-bound adenylyl cyclases, which are integral membrane proteins. Okay, so these are called adenylyl cyclase 1, adenylyl cyclase 2, adenylyl cyclase 3, all the way up to adenylyl cyclase 9, AC9. And now I want to draw your picture of their structure. So if we have the membrane here, adenylyl cyclase enzymes are all a single polypeptide, okay, and the amino terminus of this polypeptide is intracellularly, okay. It then is going to have its first membrane-spanning alpha helix. And actually, adenylyl cyclase structure has two clusters of six membrane-spanning alpha helices, and I'll show you this now. Okay, so what's going to happen is the polypeptide is going to continually span the membrane, like so, to make a cluster of six membrane-spanning alpha helices, like so. And this cluster of six membrane-spanning alpha helices is known as the transmembrane domain 1. Okay, so this is TMD1. So this stands for transmembrane, that's the TM. And then the D stands for domain. So this is the first transmembrane domain. It's a cluster of six membrane spanning alpha helices that all cluster together. Okay, you then have a loop that's intracellularly between transmembrane domain 1, this first cluster of six membrane spanning alpha helices, and then transmembrane domain 2, which is a second cluster of six membrane spanning alpha helices. Okay, so this cluster here is known as TMD2 for transmembrane domain 2, and then you have a little um, domain that's intracellularly down here. Okay, before you then finish with the carboxylic acid terminus of the polypeptide. Okay, so this is the membrane-spanning topology of an adenylyl cyclase enzyme. So it is a single polypeptide, and there are nine different forms of adenylyl cyclase. So nine different polypeptides, which will all have different sequences of amino acids, but which all have the same membrane-spanning topology. As I say, the soluble adenylyl cyclase doesn't look like this at all. It's not an integral membrane protein. It's within the cytoplasm. Okay, so let's highlight up some more special domains. Okay, so this loop between transmembrane domain 1 and transmembrane domain 2, this is known as the C1 domain. And C1 can be further divided up into two portions. Okay, so here, which I'm now going to highlight in pink, this is called C1A domain. Okay, and this second portion here, which I'm now going to highlight in orange, this is called the C1B domain, okay? So you split the C1 domain into these two portions, C1A and C1B, okay? Meanwhile, this domain uh, that's after transmembrane domain 2, this is known as the C2 domain, okay? And C2 domains can be split into two portions as well. There's the C2A portion, which is closer to transmembrane domain 2, which I think I will also highlight in pink here, okay? And then we've got the C2B domain, which is closer to the carboxylic acid tail here, and I'll highlight that in green. Okay, right. So this is the structure of our adenylyl cyclase enzyme then. Right, so... 
which portion is actually going to catalyze the cyclase reaction then is the question. Okay, so which portion is the active enzyme? Well, people's initial reactions, if they don't know the answer to this, is they point at the transmembrane domains because those look so impressive, they must be the enzyme. But it is not the transmembrane domains which make up the active enzyme. Instead, the active adenylalcyclase enzyme is actually made by a dimerization of the C1A domain with the C2A domain. So this structure that I have drawn here of an adenylalcyclase, this is an inactive adenylalcyclase because at the moment the C1A domain and the C2A domain are separate. Okay, to get an active adenylalcyclase, what you need to do is bind C1A to C2A, and then that dimer of C1A and C2A will then be an active enzyme which will uh, catalyze the cyclase reaction, which we'll discuss in a moment. Okay, so to activate the adenylalcyclase, what needs to happen is you need to get the dimerization of C1A and C2A. And I'll draw this now. Okay, so here is transmembrane domain 1 this cluster of six membrane-spanning alpha helices here. Here's the amino terminus of the polypeptide here. Then we've got this C1 domain here, which is the loop between transmembrane domain 1 and transmembrane domain 2, which is over here. Okay, and now in the active enzyme, we need C1A and C2A dimerized together. So I'm going to use a little bit of artistic license here and stretch this carboxylic acid terminal portion here out somewhat. Okay, so that I've uh, made C2A much bigger so that I can actually get it sort of dimerized with the C1A domain here. Okay, right, so let's now show this. So in, per sorry, in pink here, Here's C1A again, and here's C2A, both now in pink, and they're now dimerized together, so this is now an active adenylalcyclase enzyme. Okay, we've then also got the C1B domain here in orange, and the C2B domain here in green. Okay, so this is what we need to do to actually activate the adenylalcyclase to um, make it actually have a functional enzyme which will then catalyze the cyclase reaction. But what exactly is the reaction that adenylalcyclase uh, catalyzes, i.e. what is the cyclase reaction? Well, let's now discuss that. Uh, the cyclase reaction is the conversion of adenosine triphosphate, ATP, into cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate. Okay, so we'll start off with what is ATP, what is adenosine triphosphate? Okay, so to answer that question, we need to be familiar with what adenosine is. So we'll start off with what adenosine is, and then we'll progress to adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so adenosine is the name for adenine bound to ribose. So I'll draw you a little cartoon down here. So here is my ribose sugar, which is a pentameric uh, structure where four of the atoms are carbons and then th this atom at the top is an oxygen. Okay, and then coming off this fourth carbon, you then have the fifth carbon up here. Okay, so this is um, our ribose sugar in blue here. Okay, and uh, what we need to do to turn this into adenosine is we need to add on the organic base adenine. Okay, so this is the difference between adenine and adenosine. Adenine is the organic base. Adenosine means the organic base bound to a ribose sugar. Okay, so I'm drawing the organic base adenine just as a rectangle with an A written in it and highlighted in green. Okay, right. So this then is the structure of adenosine. It's ribose plus adenine. Okay, right. So to convert it into adenosine triphosphate, well, all we need to do is stick three phosphate groups coming off the fifth carbon up here. That's a little bit difficult because I haven't really left enough space, so usually I would draw this going vertically upward, and that's the way people usually show it, but because there's no space, we'll have it going sideways. So we have three phosphate groups here attached onto the fifth carbon of our ribose sugar. Okay, so these are the three phosphates. Now, the free phosphates of an adenosine triphosphate molecule or an ATP molecule are usually given names. The one that's closest to the fifth carbon of the ribose sugar is called the alpha phosphate. The one that then is after the alpha phosphate is called the beta phosphate. And the one after the beta phosphate is called the gamma phosphate. So you have the alpha, the beta, and the gamma phosphate of adenosine triphosphate. 
Okay, so that's the uh, structure of an adenosine triphosphate molecule, or at least a cartoon of the structure of an adenosine triphosphate molecule. What's now going to happen is adenylyl cyclase enzymes are going to uh, take this molecule in and convert it to a molecule known as cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Okay, and for short, cyclic adenosine monophosphate is usually abbreviated to CAMP. And it's usually called uh, cyclic AMP rather than CAMP. Okay, right. So CAMP is short for cyclic adenosine monophosphate. So if this was just adenosine monophosphate, we'd know exactly what to do. We'd take our adenosine molecule and we'd just have a single phosphate group coming off it. Okay, so we cut the beta and the alpha phosphate apart and then throw off that double um, phosphate here and then that would be adenosine monophosphate but we want more than that we want cyclic adenosine monophosphate so how do we make cyclic adenosine monophosphate well basically we bind this alpha phosphate to the alcohol group that comes off the third carbon of the ribose sugar okay so we've just hydrolyzed the bond between the beta and the alpha phosphate that means the alpha phosphate can now bind to something else we're going to bind it to this carbon down here uh, or rather we're going to bind it to the alcohol group that comes off this carbon here. Now, let me draw you then a little cartoon for this. So here we have our um, ribose sugar here, and then the organic base coming off the side is an adenine organic base still. Then we've got our fifth carbon going up there, and we've got the phosphate group coming off the fifth carbon, which is now linked to that third carbon down there. Okay, so this is a phosphate group here. We've then got our ribose sugar in blue, okay, and then our adenine organic base is in green here. Okay, so that is cyclic adenosine monophosphate then, and it's called cyclic adenosine monophosphate because we've got an extra cyclic structure here, basically. We've got an extra cycle within the structure. Okay, now what's the other product of this conversion? Well, the other product is what we got when we cleave the alpha and the beta phosphate apart down here, which is the beta and the phosph sorry, the beta and the gamma phosphates still linked together. Okay, and when you have two phosphate groups linked together like this, there's a special name for that molecule. That molecule is called a pyrophosphate molecule. Okay, and the abbreviation for pyrophosphate is to write PP for pyrophosphate, and then people put in a little I there for inorganic. So it's the same as when people write just a free phosphate group as PI. It means inorganic phosphate. Well, when you've got two phosphate groups, we write PPI. Okay, right. So that's the cyclase reaction and the product of the cyclase reaction. So what we now need to turn our attention to is the classification of all of these adenylyl cyclase enzymes, these nine adenylyl cyclase enzymes, into four families. I would just like to present that classification. And then we need to discuss how uh, alpha S subunits with GTP bound, or potentially alpha OLF subunits uh, with GTP bound, are going to activate adenylyl cyclases. And they're actually going to activate all nine of them. But We'll start in the next video by the cla with the classification of adenylyl cyclases into, or at least the membrane-bound adenylyl cyclases. We're going to ignore the tenth one uh, into five. Sorry, into four families. Okay, so see you in the next video.